Hannah is going to kick us off. Good afternoon, Barbecue Boot Campers. Can you believe it's the last day of camp? Have y'all been having fun learning about meat science, meeting fellow campers on Flipgrid and the Daily Cahoots? My personal favorite has been meeting new people, as it always is with Louisiana 4-H. I'm Hannah Rockmore from Natchitoches Parish, and welcome to the final day of Louisiana 4-H Virtual Barbecue Boot Camp. I'm so excited to have you join us. Let's kick today off the best way we know how with the 4-H Pledge and a good old camp song. Stand up and join me in saying the 4-H Pledge. I pledge my head to clear thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, and my health to better living for my club, my community, my country, and my world. Now let's get jiggy with it. Do y'all know the camp song, I'm going on a lion hunt? Well, let's get down with this song and let's sing it. You ready? We're going on a lion hunt. I've got my binoculars. I'm not scared. We're going through the tall grass. Swish, 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 swish. We're going on a lion hunt. I've got my binoculars. I'm not scared. Look, there's a big river. We can't go over it. We can't go under it. We're just going to have to swim through it. Splash, 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 splash. We're going on a lion hunt. I've got my binoculars. I'm not scared. There, there's a big puddle of mud. We can't go over it. We can't go under it. We're just gonna have to go through it. Squish, 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 squish. We're going on a lion hunt. I've got my binoculars. I'm not scared. Look, there's a dark and scary cave. We can't go over it. We can't go under it. We're just gonna have to go into it. Step, 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 step. We're going on a lion hunt. I've got my binoculars. I'm not scared. It's really dark in here. I feel two big ears. I feel one wet nose. I feel two sharp teeth. I know exactly what this is. It's a lion. Hurry up, let's get out of here. Back through the cave, step, step, step. Back through the mud, squish, squish, squish. Back through the river, splash, splash, splash. Back through the tall grass, swish, swish, swish. Back into the house, back up the stairs, back into the bedroom. Whew, I am not going lion hunting anymore. Whew. Man, am I pumped for today. Don't forget to join me, Louisiana 4-H, and tons of our friends at Family Game Night tonight on YouTube at 7 p.m. Ms. Crystal Ayers, our state animal scientist specialist, and Ms. Claire Zach, our healthy living, our state healthy living specialist, are going to take it from here, making you into barbecue beef masters. Hannah was amazing. Thank you, Hannah. Welcome to day three. We're so pumped of barbecue boot camp. Barbecue Boot Camp Beef Edition. Yes, today we are sponsored by the Louisiana Beef Industry Council. Thank you, LBIC. And it is all about beef. All about beef. So to get things kicked off, we know y'all are already pumped and ready for the last day of camp. So ready. Y'all went on a lion hunt already. 
Give us some lions. Give Show us some lions. binoculars. Show us your binoculars. We want to see all of the emojis. Show us how you swim in. And we're going to introduce ourselves, and then we're going to get going. Mm -hmm. And be sure to share, share, share this live. We want everyone here mm -hmm. for beef day. Yeah. And we want everyone to meet each other yes. using Flipgrid. Yes. And we have a special surprise for you on Flipgrid Day. Our state 4-H president, Woo! Anna Little, yes. has left a special message just for our boot campers. So young or old, please download Flipgrid Come and on. say hi to everyone. Come on over. So I am Crystal Arns, the Louisiana 4-H Animal Science Specialist. I am Claire Zach. I'm the Louisiana 4-H Healthy Living Specialist. Back again with our control center, we have Ms. Christina Zito A. Bear, and she is our 4-H Career Readiness Specialist. Say hey. Happy Thursday, everybody. Hi. Welcome. Woo. So let's just get cracking. Let's do it. Now, next slide should have our agenda on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have Ms. Christina's pulling up our agenda. Ms. Claire, we've been going over, yeah, animal science, meat science, every day, every single day. And we're going to do the same thing today, but we are going to cover animal science just a little bit less mm -hmm. because I know that everyone out there has a lot of beef questions. We do. And we want to make sure we answer all of them. Yeah. Ask them all. We want to know. But after all, all of that goodness, we will have recipes. All of the recipes. And we also have a special little session on steak evaluation yeah. and how to make the most out of the steaks that you yes. buy in the grocery store. Yeah. So, everybody, you're ready for the line hunt. Get ready. Hey, I'm on screen today. Nice to see you all. I no longer have an imaginary friend. Yeah. Miss Claire is here. No more playing chicken. Today's beef day. We show it up. So, put some T-bones yeah. and meat emojis. Yes. Fires. Get ready. Okay, let's dive in. Ms. Crystal, we've been talking about every day. We've talked about all the names that we call our animals. So I'm a scientist. What do I call cattle? So as you'll see, as Ms. Christina brings up our cattle facts slide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, we've had a scientific name for everything. Yeah. Guys, I know y'all know this. Mm -hmm. On pig day, oh, our, what was it? What, what was our scientific name? Tell us. Tell us. Tell us that scientific name and give us a pig emoji. Yeah. If maybe you don't know that one, do you remember the poultry day? Oh, Miss Claire had a little memory trick for that. It was like aviation. Very similar to aviation. Thanks a lot. So if you can remember the scientific name for chicken, give us that name with a chicken emoji. Tell us. But today, today it's bovine. Bovine. Our scientific name for cattle are bovine. I like that. Very, very cool. Pretty cool. Okay, so when we have the babies, like with pigs, we have piglets or they were actually called pigs, or chickens, they were chicklets, or actually chicks. So now do we have cowlets? Not quite. Oh, okay. We just have cows. Oh, like your leg muscle. Just like your leg muscle. Very cool. Cat. I like that. So, Miss Christina, what were our scientific answers? Did we get anything good? Let's see. Hold on. Anybody have my aviation? No? Nothing pork yet? shire. Pork oh, we're getting there. Porking. Or par sign. Par sign. P-O-R-C-I-N-E. Yes, Yay! Yes. <laughs> so, por sign. Absolutely. And there what was our scientific name for chickens? You see it? Started with an A. a aviary? Avian. Close. So, very aviary close. is very close. Yeah. But, yes, avian. So, we have por sign for pigs, avian for chickens, Bovine for cattle. Type that in that chat. Show yes. us that bovine. Give us a little Show cow emoji. Uh, or or cow bull emoji. emoji. Yeah. Or whatever it is. And so we also know mm -hmm. that everything's had a different length of time it takes to yes. have that calf or that pig yes. or that chick. And so we call that gestation. It's the time it takes to grow the animal and the mom. Tell us what the gestation for pigs is. There was a fun little way to remember it. Yes. That one was great. And so for today, we have a bigger animal. Mm -hmm. It takes a little bit longer. If you're growing a bigger baby, it's going to take more time. About 283 days. Woo! About wow. nine months. Oh, okay. So like the same amount of time it takes to grow a human. Exactly. Pretty Very cool. similar. Pretty Very cool. similar. So now that we got all that, mm -hmm. we've been calling animals 
by different names. Right. Each animal, we have what we call the male, what we call the female. So how, how does that line up for our cow? So it, it follows suit, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. like everything else. Yeah. Miss Christina, will we get some answers for those pig gestation dates? Just let Ooh. us know. Let us know. And will so do. In males mm -hmm. for cattle, we have an intact male is a bull. A bull, so that means that he can have babies. He can make babies. He can make babies. He can't have them. Uh oh. Aaron Gravois, three months, three days, three weeks. That's very good. Yay, Aaron, thank yes. you. Three months, three weeks, and three days, 114 days total for pigs. Jody well, Guillory, well, same thing, 114. Oh, that's amazing. There it is. So, in cattle, mm -hmm. a male that can make babies is a bull. Mm -hmm. A male that cannot make babies that we typically use for meat okay. is a steer. A steer. So a bull can make babies. A steer can be is going to be good meat. Yes. And that's our males. That's our males. But what did what did Miss Claire just do there? She put some horns up. I put some horns. Does that mean that only male cattle have horns? It does not. Not at all. Nope. All cattle, depending on their breed, can actually have horns. Yep. Males or females. Very cool. Horns do nothing more than tell us if their breed allows them to have horns. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. Now, females. Let's talk about it. So now we use that popular word that everybody loves. Cow. Cows. Cows are actually a very specific type of cow. Cows are the females who have had babies before. Okay. So the females who have had calves before. Yes. They are called cows. Yes. They're the moms. Cow. Cow. <laughs> so what if they've never had a cow before? They've never had if they've never had a cat before, they're known as a heifer. A heifer. Okay. So if they've had a cat before, cow, no cat, heifer. Absolutely. Okay. And while we're on the topic, mm -hmm. let's just cover a little bit. What did we just say? We said cows were very specific. Yes. So when you're talking about a group of bovine, bovine, are they all cows? Well, if it's a bunch of mom cows in a field, then yes. So maybe if you see a bunch of females with babies running around, it is a field of cows. But for the most part, when we talk about cattle in a group, mm -hmm. we're going to call them cattle. Cattle. Okay. So typically when you see a field of bovine, yep. it's cattle. Yes. It's cattle because we don't know. We yeah. don't know if they're males or females, if they have babies or not. Okay. Okay. Cow. Very cool. Short and sweet. Love it. So... How many of our cattle do we have in the U.S.? Okay, Miss Christina is going to show us on the next slide that we actually have 53.4 billion, Woo! billion with a B, and that's how much many pounds of beef is produced in the U.S. That's a lot. It's a lot. Wow. And so that's only coming from cattle that are used to be Oh, so like our dairy cattle, that's not counted in that 53.4 billion. Not all of our dairy cattle. Now, here's a fun fact. Mm -hmm. Dairy cattle are used for what, Miss Claire? They're used for milk. They're used for milk. Exactly. They provide yeah. us dairy. But what about when they stop producing milk? They stop producing milk? Well, sometimes maybe they're just not good milk producers or, you know, maybe they don't breed back. They don't have a baby. Uh -huh. Or do males produce milk? Males, humans, do not produce milk, and male animals do not produce milk. Oh, so our male cattle that are dairy cattle, what do we do with them? Well, we make use of them, and we actually eat them. Oh. And there's actually a large portion of our beef uh -huh. that come from dairy-type cattle. Wow. Because we have to do something with the males. Okay, makes sense. And so we actually do, this does include a lot of dairy numbers okay. as well. But we have lots of forms of beef production. So we are focusing on the fact that we produce 53 billion pounds. Billion. And that's just in one year. Wow. So, of course, are we under no surprise that the number one beef producing state, they're proud of it, is Texas. It's Texas. You know, there's also a lot of feedlots found out in those, like, um, very desolate areas of, like, Nebraska and Kansas, the panhandle of Oklahoma. Very cool. Very much. When I lived in Kansas, I actually lived in an area called Garden City. Oh. And there were more cattle numbers than there were people living in that <laughs> town. No way. Absolutely. That's awesome. Yes. Very cool. So now that we know that the U.S. produces a ton of beef, lots of it, and we are proud of it. We are. 
We also know when we go grocery shopping, it can be very hard to figure out what beef to buy, mm -hmm. what all these words mean, what is grass fed, what is not grass fed. It's what a is, lot. It's a lot. It's a lot of words. And yeah. so on the next slide, we're going to talk about types of beef production. Okay. And really, there's a lot of different types. Mm -hmm. But the two that tend to be brought up a lot mm -hmm. are grain finish, grain finish, and grass finish, grass finish. And it's very confusing uh -huh. what those things mean. Okay. And so let's just start out from a health perspective. Mm -hmm. When you see these types of beef in the grocery store, yes. Well, Miss Claire, you're the healthy living specialist. Is grain finished or grass finished beef any healthier for me? That's a great question. There is no big difference. There really isn't a difference. So according to the LBIC, what they teach us is that with the three things that we focus on, the zinc, iron, and protein, or you can remember it, zip, that is, they're the same in our grass fed or our grain fed. So either one of those is going to give us really great protein, great zinc, great iron, and it's going to be really healthy for us. We don't have to worry about the nutrition. Okay, so it really just goes into personal preference. Personal preference. So, and that is true. Mm -hmm. When an animal is grown on certain types of grass or different things along those lines, it can affect the flavor of the beef. And some people really like that earthy, deep, beefy flavor, sometimes they say. Mm -hmm. um, but really, what it means is so cattle, we've been talk talking about digestive systems. Mm -hmm. They have a very special type of digestive system. Okay. And we're going to talk more about that later. But that special digestive system makes them so good at eating grass. Huh, cool. Absolutely. And what so, you? Well, it has that ability to take grass, uh -huh. turn it into protein. That's amazing. It's an amazing animal. We can't do that. We cannot do that. Our other animals, pigs and chickens, mm -hmm. what have we said in the last two days of camp? We've said that we eat the muscle of an animal. Yes. And if you've missed that, if you've missed some of that really specific animal science, the great thing about virtual camp is that you can go back and relive any day of camp that you want. Forever. So go check out those videos. It's there forever. And remember that from a live animal, we eat their muscle. We convert muscle to meat. And so pigs and chickens, we have to feed them protein. Mm -hmm. We have to feed them energy. We have to give them, just like we have to give us, what we need to build muscle. But cattle and their amazing digestive system mm -hmm. can take grass and convert it into protein. No way. Absolutely. That's so cool. So, the only difference between grass and grain finish uh -huh. is the reason we call it grain finish and grass finish. So, a majority of all cattle's life is spent on grass. Oh. Because we don't have to give them anything else. Yeah. They are perfect at utilizing that grass. And grass is pretty cheap. But protein is very expensive. Yes. So, the longer we can keep them on grass, the better. But, just like when we take protein supplements, Supplements, we can grow faster. Mm -hmm. If we supplement our beef with protein of mm -hmm. some sort, mm -hmm. or grain in this case, yeah, because um, we know we've been getting protein from soybeans and things along those lines. Yeah, yep, absolutely. We can help them grow faster. Oh. And so, all beef is grown on grass, okay. but grass finished or 100% grass fed means that they never were supplemented with anything other than grass. And grain means that they were on grass a majority of their life, mm -hmm. and then they were finished for the last few months on grain and hay. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. We have a quick question from Lynette. Does the food a cow eats affect the taste of the beef meat? Good question. That's a great question. And so the easiest comparison to this that we use a lot is if a dairy animal was to go and graze on wild onions, mm -hmm. their milk would actually taste a little oniony, just a hint. Not significantly, mm -hmm. but a little bit. So if you think about a grass-fed animal raising on grass its entire life, yeah. the only thing it consumed, if it is consuming anything wild that would have a flavor, mm -hmm. it can be found in the beef, but there's not a ton of influence on that, but yes, absolutely grass types and forage types can influence, but it does have to be consumed for a very long time before that flavor gets into the muscle itself. So they're similar, but some people might argue that craft finish can have a slightly different flavor. Absolutely, and some people love it, and some people hate it. Again, preference. Preference. 
Any other good questions? Um, How can you tell if a cow had a baby if you don't know? That's a wonderful That's question. coming in from Tina. Actually, it looks like Evan is on Tina's account. Okay, Evan. We have a lot of those. That's okay. Tell us your name. If your, your account is associated with someone else, tell us who our is. Is. So, hey, Evan. So, Evan, how can you tell if it is a cow and not a heifer? Well, Evan, I hate to break it to you, but it really just takes a lot of practice, and you just kind of have to know. Farmers and ranchers, they track and they record which cows have had calves so they know if one um, has calved and needs to breed back or if they miss a year or something happened. So they keep very close records. But there are a few other ways you can tell. Um, a lot of sides, their other sides will change because when they're a heifer, it's very small. And as they start producing milk to have milk for their baby, it gets bigger. And it will dry up, but it will never go back quite to that same size, so other size can help you with that. Um, and then other than there, there's a few other ways, um, looking at some of the reproductive areas. That Something that a veterinarian might know. Something that the people who look at those animals every single day for their entire life, and that's their job, mm -hmm. they would definitely know. But really, for the everyday person, it takes a lot of practice, yeah. That's a great question, Evan. Yeah, good question. Okay, so we're gonna keep going. Now that we kind of understand that, um, cattle are really good on grass, and we've kind of gotten that out of the way. Today is all about asking questions. Yes. And so fill our feet full of questions because we've left lots of time to answer them. Please. But, Miss Claire, Molly told us on Flipgrid yesterday. Yeah. So Molly told us that the most things she was looking forward to today were green. I love the green. The green has been so much because they're so cute. They've been so cute. If y'all remember from pig day, there were about eight main pig breeds of pigs. So if you remember any of your breeds or if you had a favorite, throw it in the chat. Let us know what your favorite pig breed was. And if you already know, just by looking at the slide that says popular beef cattle breeds, you can tell us what your favorite beef cattle breed is as well. And what's your favorite breed? So my favorite breed is actually Brahmin cattle. So I grew up on a ranch in Arkansas with Brahmin cattle. Very cool. And then I moved down here to Louisiana, and Brahmin cattle are probably one of the most popular breeds down here in Louisiana because they're well suited for how hot it is. And so there are so many breeds of cattle, guys, that we're not going to get into all this because we could spend hours and hours and hours over all of these different breeds. There's a lot. But Molly, I definitely hope you're on, and definitely tell us your favorite. Um, but we're going to move to the next slide because I want to talk to you a little bit about the differences between breeds. Not about specific ones, but differences. So, do you remember over the last couple of days we've been talking about different types of breeds? Mm -hmm. There's been, mm -hmm. um, what have been the top two types? Some are, some are the good mom, right? Okay. There are maternal, and then some are the ones that are good meat, and they are our terminal. Yes. So, moms are maternal. Yes. Meat is terminal. Yes. And we have that across all species. Mm -hmm. So our broiler chickens, yes, or our terminal, and our laying hens, or our maternal, yes. And so it happens in cattle too, but things get a little complicated. Yeah. So I'm going to give y'all a couple of tougher words that you're really going to have to to work through with me, but we can do it. It's it's really good to we're, understand. We're on our way to being beef geniuses. We can do it. Yeah. We can do this. Yeah. So do you remember how I said my favorite type of cow were brahmin? Brahmin. And they're really suited to the heat. Yes. So one of the reasons they're really suited to heat is that they're known as Boss Indicus cattle. Boss Indicus cattle. It means they have short hair, short hair, and long ears, long ears, which gives them more surface area, so they can disperse heat better. Okay. To okay. have loose skin Ooh, as well. They can shake off those bugs. They're actually one of the only breeds of cattle that can shake their skin. Cool. And so because they can shake off bugs, mm -hmm. they also have some other preventative methods. Mm -hmm. They have those long ears, that short hair. They're super, super good at heat tolerance. Okay. So they can handle the heat. They can handle the heat. So our boss indicus can handle the heat. And they also tend to be very, very motherly. Oh, they're our maternal. They're very maternal. Oh, cool. The other type mm -hmm. is our boss Taurus. Boss Taurus. And while 
A lot of Boss Taurus cattle are very maternal. Mm -hmm. Very maternal. Mm -hmm. We also find a majority of our terminal breed mm -hmm. in the Boss Taurus category. So our Boss Taurus is our terminal, which means that's good meat. Yes. Okay. And they tend to be long haired, long hair, short ears, short ears, and they like it cold. Cold. Because of their long hair. Because of their long hair. Makes sense. So there are fluffy cows. There are fluffy cattle. Uh, now, obviously, you can find um, boss horse cattle here in Louisiana. You can find boss industry cattle further north. They definitely can be crossing those lines. But just as a general statement, mm -hmm. boss indicus like peat and they're maternal. Boss taurus likes cold and they're meat. Boss indicus, maternal, peat, boss taurus, terminal, cold. Absolutely. Got it. We got it. Miss Christina, did anybody tell us what their favorite breeds were? Oh, yes, we got Brangus. We got another Brahmin Whoa. as well. We got Simmental. Oh. Looks like about it for, for now. Okay. Um, Good choices, guys. I just love them all. I do too. Yeah. And okay. Miss Lindsay says fluffy cows. I agree. Oh, Miss Lindsay, I agree. The fluffy ones are so cute. Okay. So, we talked about animal science, mm -hmm. meat production types. We have one last thing to talk about in animal science, just we have every day. Yeah. So we're going to move to the next slide, and we're going to start talking about that nutrition. What do they eat? What do they eat? We've already talked about this. Yeah. Guys, what do cattle eat? Tell Can us. You put us in, tell us in words. Put some emojis. Ooh. I know there's an emoji. Yeah. yeah, there's an emoji. So go find some emojis. And what do cattle eat? Yeah. And so we know that mm -hmm. nutritionally, 67% of all production costs go from nutrition. It's a lot. Yeah. So if we can focus on grass, it's just something a little cheaper to yeah. grow. Yeah. It is helpful that we keep the cattle on grass as long as possible. Mm -hmm. That's why they eat grass the majority of their life. Makes sense. That's why we also feed them hay. But you also remember how I said there's that really special system that they have? It can go from grass to protein. Yes. And that grass to protein system requires grass. They have to have grass or hay or something in their system at all times mm -hmm. or they're going to bloat. Uh, and so they have to have all of that grass. And so before we get into this, we've been talking about digestive systems mm -hmm. and stomachs yes. in other animals. Do yes. y'all remember what the other type of system was called? We said that if you stuck around until today, you'd learn the special system that cattle have. And so tell us in the comments what the other system was. But today we're dealing with ruminant cattle. Ruminant. Ruminant means they have four compartment in one stomach. There you go. So it's one stomach with four compartments. And within those compartments, we can think of it like a fermentation station, which means that it makes really good bacteria. It makes really good bacteria. And all those bacteria take all that grass and hay and forage, and they convert it to protein. And within those, we're not going to get too into it. But I wanted to give you a quick little hint on how to remember what those four stomach compartments are called. Bring it on. So there's a word you can remember, okay? Roar. Roar! Like a lion. Like a lion! You went lion hunting, didn't yep. you? Yep. And give us a roar. Give, give us, us a roar. roar. So, Miss Christina, before I explain what those four ruminant compartments are, did we get any answers for that other digestive system? It started with an M. Monogastic yes! from Aaron. Yes. Aaron Mudge. Thank you, Mon Aaron. Gastric. Me good. One stomach. One stomach. And so in the ruminant system, we have those four compartments. Mm -hmm. We know we're going to say roar. Mm -hmm. And it stands for rumen, rumen, omasum, omasum, abomasum, abomasum, and reticulum. Reticulum. And they have to have all that for their big fermentation station, for their good bacteria. Good bacteria. And that's how they use all that wonderful grass. So cool. So cool. So the last thing we've been talking about when you every day is feed conversion. How much does it take to produce one pound of meat? All of our other animals have been small. We have a bigger animal. Okay. Our conversion rate going up. What's the weight of a cow that we want? So when we're looking for production, when we probably got harvest our, our animals that we're growing for um, beef at anywhere between 1,200 and, and 1,300 pounds. Well, that can vary. That's a big cow. On average, we're going to look at like 1250. So I bet it has to eat a lot of food. It has to eat a ton of food. It's a really big cow. It's a really big cow. Okay. So when we finish cattle on grain, remember we're supplementing protein so they can grow faster, it only takes 
six to eight, but on average six pounds of feed mm -hmm. for one pound of muscle. Oh, okay. But you, if you've been in the grocery store mm -hmm. and you've seen that grass finish, mm -hmm. which we said is only based on preference, yeah. the reason it's so much more expensive is because it takes longer to grow that animal. Yeah. And it's actually going to take 12 pounds of consumed grass whoo, to gain one pound of muscle. So double, double. Wow. Which is why the price takes more. We also tend to be able to get our grain finished feed to harvest in about 12 months. Oh, okay. But in our grass finish, it's going to take closer to 18 to 20. Oh, wow. That's a big difference. It's a big difference. So it makes sense that grass fed is more expensive. Absolutely. Okay. And that's it, Miss Claire. We are done with animal science. We're, we're moving on to Miss Crystal's favorite part. Meat science. Meat science. And this is the part that the LBIC mm -hmm. loves to talk about. We love to talk about it too. Who wouldn't? Yeah. It's beef. It's awesome. Do we have any questions? Not right now. Not right now. Looks like now. we're good. So, since it's meat science time, guys, I'm going to need those emojis. Yes. I want to see those meat emojis. Show us what sort of beef you like to eat. Give and Miss Christina, something to show on that screen. Yes. A quick question from Madeline. Okay. About how old are cows when they are harvested? So cattle. Average. Cattle when they're harvested, mm -hmm. um, because we don't really harvest our cows. Remember? Yes. We really harvest our steers and maybe some heifers. Okay. Okay. But we harvest our cattle mm -hmm. at a route for grain finished around 12 months of age. Okay. But for grass, it takes a lot longer, mm -hmm. and those are going to be older. But a majority of our cattle, their grain finish is about 12 months age. Hmm, about a year. Great question. Good question. Okay, so let's do it. Now, if you remember from Pig Day, mm -hmm. go watch Pig Day. Yeah. There were a lot of different cuts that come from that animal because it's so big. Big animal, big cuts. We could spend hours talking about all the different names of all the different types of cuts, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you'll never remember it. Yeah. I've been doing this for a long time, and even sometimes I forget what they're called. So we're going to break this down into something a little simpler for you to remember when you're grocery shopping with your parents. Maybe it's your night for family cooking night, yeah. and you want to do something with beef. We're going to show you how to make the most of it. Let's do it. So who remembers talking about support muscles and locomotion muscles? Give us a hand raise. Show us your meat emojis. Yeah. Raise your hands. Tell us who remembers talking about locomotion versus support muscles. Miss Claire, locomotion is for muscles and tells us that it's tender or tough, right? Yes. So locomotion means we move. Let's go on a walk, Miss Claire. Right. We're walking. how we do it. We're walking. If we were cattle yep. and we were out in the field yep. and we were walking, uh -huh. what parts of our body are we moving the most? I'm moving my arms and my legs the most. Arms and shoulders mm -hmm. and legs. Mm -hmm. My hips. Your hips. Been, yep. So what parts of us are not moving as much? Pretty much your middle. Pretty much your middle. Yeah. Your middle, your back. It's mm -hmm. not really moving as much as it's supporting. Yeah. So let's talk about that for a second. Support muscles are tender muscles by nature. Mm -hmm. The more they support, mm -hmm. sorry, even less they support, mm -hmm. and the less they support, the even more tender they are. Yeah. Um, and so the less they move, the more tender they are. The more they move, the tougher they are. Just like us, when we move our muscles to build strong muscles, they get strong and tough. And so if we're talking about our middle section, mm -hmm. who out there loves a good T-bone or a ribeye? Those are some very popular steak cuts. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show you all exactly where that T-bone is found. So I want you to raise your hands, raise them up. Put it on your back, just like we did on pig day. Find that vertebrae, find your backbone, and that muscle around your hand there. You're going to have one on each side. That's your T-bone. It's a T because of your vertebrae, mm -hmm. and it's a T-bone. And it's a support muscle because it's in our back, so it's tender, so it makes a good stay. Delicious. And as you move up your body, you find your ribs, mm -hmm. which are also supported. There's a muscle there as well. That's our ribeye. It moves even less than the T-bone, really? so it tends to be even more tender. Very cool. And so those are some of your most popular ones. Okay. And those are support muscles. Okay. So everything else is pretty much a locomotion muscle. Oh, very cool. And it's tough. And we are at barbecue boot camp. Barbecue boot camp. Okay, guys, this is the first day we're going to mention it. First time today we're going to mention it. Define 
barbecue. What is it? Tell us. It's a time and temperature combined. Mm -hmm. I want mm -hmm. to see that chat flooding with comments Tell us. on what it defines as barbecue. Yes. And these cuts, mm -hmm. these locomotion cuts, mm -hmm. are really good for barbecue because they're tough. Yeah. And because of this method uh -huh. that they're going to tell us, they're wonderful for barbecue or non-traditional barbecue methods. Love that. And it's going to be a wonderful time. Uh oh. We have a question. Okay. We might get to it later. Um, Hillary asked, "What is the best way to slaughter a cow?" Several Ooh. people have asked. Best Do you have recommendations, or maybe maybe most humane best right. practice? Wow. We will talk a little bit about harvest before we get into recipes. Okay, we have some time there. Yeah, so awesome. We'll get there. We will definitely talk about that. So we talked about our support muscles. Mm -hmm. So tell me about those local mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to give you some words to associate with those tougher cuts. Mm -hmm. So we already know that our rib and our loin or T bones. Our support and tender. Mm -hmm. So when you see those words on a package, you can know. But then you have chuck and round. So the chuck is your shoulder. Yes. And the round is your leg. Okay. And since those parts move a lot, mm -hmm. they're very tough. And that's okay. how the chicken grows. Oh, uh, makes sense. And since they're so tough, a lot of people don't know what to do with them. Yeah. So they're cheaper. Uh, and so they can fit into a budget when you need to. Love that. Miss Christina loves. For financial fitness. Love a budget. Love a budget, guys. Love a budget. <laughs> so you can get a lot of good stuff out of those chucks and rounds. You're cooked for all. Chuck roast, your round roast. Yes. What about your hips? So your hips move a little less than all those other areas. Yeah. But a little more than all those support areas. Right. And so does the sirloin. Oh, okay. And actually, when I lived in Texas, mm -hmm. when you go to the big barbecue pit places, uh -huh. they will have whole smoked sirloins on their menu. And it's Fantastic. Sounds delicious. And since it's a um, locomotion muscle, it's a little cheaper. Mm -hmm. It goes with that. Okay, Miss Christina, did we get a definition? What is barbecue? Oh, we got plenty of low and slow, low and slow and slow. smoked, yes. lots of low, low and smoked. And Thank you, Tina, Amy, Layla. Y'all got it going on. So good. Thank you for being barbecue masters. Barbecue geniuses. And so, since we cook those low and slow, mm -hmm. it's a great piece. But there's one other part of the animal that's mm -hmm. very popular for beef. It is. We barbecue a lot of this. We smoke a lot of this. Do y'all know what cut I'm talking about just offhand? It's one that's pictured right there, but mm -hmm. I have not talked about. It's the one we're going to give recipes about today. We are. See if y'all can put it in there. Yeah. And as y'all are doing that, mm -hmm. we're going to move on to that special part of today mm -hmm. about how do I pick my best steak? Yeah. Now, since we've already said barbecue is low and slow, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A single steak is not going to be barbecue. No. It's going to it be in that tender part. Absolutely. Now, if you get like a whole chunk of meat, maybe you'll do something. But really, you're going to get steaks most of the time. And we're going to hot and fast grill those. Mm -hmm. And so, when we're going to talk about that, let's figure out what steak is best. Mm -hmm. Miss Christina, did they figure out what our recipe is going to be about today? Not yet. Not yet. Not okay. yet. We're still waiting. Y'all keep y'all keep thinking, keep guessing. And Mr. Shannon, we're gonna go to the next slide with They're they talk. guessing some it looks like guest brisket. Yeah. Aaron and maybe Lindsay yeah. guessed some brisket. Yeah. We are absolutely gonna teach you how to smoke some brisket in two ways today. Two ways. But brisket is found between the front two legs of cattle. So that makes it Somewhat a support muscle, mm -hmm. but it's attached to those locomotion muscles. Yeah. So there can be some toughness in it. It's like in the middle. Right. And so there's parts of it that are tough, parts, but it does so good with a low and slow low cooking method. Low and slow. And so we are going to cover brisket today. Do it. Before we get to brisket, brisket whew, almost pretty quiet. Get that one out. And before we get to that brisket, let's talk about some steaks. Let's do some steaks. So next slide, Miss. Christina should say prime choice select and have some pictures. So, Miss Claire, there's four words I want you to learn off of this slide. Okay. The most important of those being a very long word. It is. But we're going to break it down. We can do it. It's called intra, intra muscular. Muscular. That's the big word. And okay. it's of fat. So it's intra, intra muscular fat. Muscular fat. And it means intramuscular fat. Intramuscular fat, and it means fat 
within okay. the muscle. Okay. The easiest way to refer to that, mm -hmm. and what you're going to hear most of the time, is marbling. Marbling. Marbling is fat within the muscle. Within the muscle. It's flakes, right? That's the exact word I want to use. Ah. So flakes of fat within a muscle is marbling. If you see a big chunk of fat, that's just a fat deposit. Okay. And we don't really want that. We want those flakes of fat because when we cook a steak that has lots of flakes of fat, those fat flakes melt, which means fat equals flavor. Fat equals flavor. And so those little flakes are small and individual. They melt and they make everything taste good. So when you go shopping, you want to look for a steak that has lots of intramuscular fat, a lot of marbling, lots of marbling. And if you can do that by looking at your steak. Okay. But you've probably also seen when you go grocery shopping something called a quality grade. But okay. specifically, there's three main ones you see, mm -hmm. and they're prime, choice, and select. Prime, choice, and select. Okay. Have y'all? Can y'all tell us? You got the brisket right. You've been doing great all day. Have y'all ever seen those words when you're grocery shopping before? Maybe ask mom or grandma or granddad, whoever's with y'all. Have you seen the words prime or choice or select when you were grocery shopping? So those are known as quality grades, mm -hmm. and it simply means how much marbling they have. Okay. So after that, you're already going to know how to tell how much marbling it has. You are. But in case you didn't, you can always refer to these words. Very cool. And so when it has the most marbling it could have, mm -hmm. and it's the best form of marbling that we can find, lots and lots of flavor, it is prime time. Prime beef. Yes. So <laughs> just remember, prime is the best we can do. Just like prime time television is the best time. Prime. Prime beef has the most marbling. Got it. So then our next level down, our number two category. Uh -huh. It's good, but not great. Okay. And it's choice. Choice. So it should be your mid-level choice. Okay. So maybe we're not splurging. Right. But we're going we're gonna to not do the budget line. Right. Right. So we're going to go choice. Choice. Got it. And then let's say we really want some steak. Uh -huh. We're craving that ribeye. We're we craving it. that T-bone. We want some steak. We want it. We're going to go with a select option. Okay. Okay. And all of that is defined just by the USDA and how much marbling it has. Okay. So if you look at the picture there, guys, you can see lots of those little white flecks in that picture. Mm -hmm. That's your marbling. That's how you tell. Okay. So let's put it to practice. Yeah. Miss Christina, next Slide. Bring it in. Let's go. Next slide. Yeah. What are we buying? What are we buying? Okay, guys. So as Miss Christina kind of organizes some thoughts and mm -hmm. sees what happens over there, she's our control center manager today. Mm -hmm. We're going to give you some thinking time. So out of these steaks that you see here, based on marbling uh -huh. and the amount of muscle that's in them, uh -huh. which two would you say are the best? So put the numbers of the two that you think are the best with a thumbs up or a good, and then put the two that you would probably not buy with a thumbs down or no thanks. <laughs> so, and as you're always thinking on that, we're going to leave this slide up for a good while. Yeah. So think on it, talk it out, think about it. I have a question. I thought you might. Yeah, I do. And you know what? You might have this question too. I am a little confused because number two and number three of the steaks, they have a little brown on them. Are they not fresh? What's the deal there? You know, that's a great question. So a lot of people see this in the grocery stores. They'll okay. see a, an off-colored steak. It may not be as bright cherry red as we want to see. Right. And they often think it's bad or something's been done to the other steaks to make them look so red. Yeah. But truthfully, you remember we said that we're eating the muscle, right? Right. And when it was attached to the animal, that was a living thing, right? Mm -hmm. And it had cells, and it breathed. It needed oxygen. It needed right. oxygen, just like, we do. just like we do. Well, just because we've harvested the animal doesn't mean that all of the cells and all of everything in that muscle has, has completely stopped rest of breathing. Okay. And so whenever, if you think about your own body, mm -hmm. whenever we breathe, and we get oxygen to our blood, yes. it turns red. Okay. So it's oxygenated blood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And whenever all of that oxygen has been used up in our blood system, it turns blue. Okay. And we actually call that darker color blue. Oh. And so it just means that the cells haven't been able to breathe. So maybe when you were at the grocery store, the steaks were stacked on top of each other. Oh. Maybe the package that's a little darker was on the bottom. Okay. And it just means it couldn't breathe. Or you bought a, a package of steaks that had a lot of them. 
and they were shingled or, or layered on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And when you take them home and pull them apart, you just set them on the counter mm -hmm. for about 10 to 30 minutes, depending on how big it is. Mm -hmm. I dare you to watch it change colors. Because if you look at our steaks there, around the bones, do you see how it's starting to turn colors? Yeah, it's starting to redden up a little bit. Oh. And so it's blooming. That's it's cool. breathing. It's getting that oxygen it needs. Yes. Oh, so if you have a steak that looks that kind of blue color, it might just be packaged really, really well. It could be vacuum packaging. We'll always have a dark Oh, very cool. To tell if it's really an off steak, one, look at the Best Buy date. Now, this is a guideline, not a hard concrete date. But if you start seeing anything slimy or green, the smell or it green. smells, that's when you need to start to worry about bacteria growth. Yeah. Along those lines. yeah. But if it's simply just a darker color, I wouldn't worry about it. Awesome. So, Miss Christina, have they told us what they think the best steaks are yet? Did we get it? We've got we've got all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Okay. We've got pick some of your favorites. We've got let's see, um, one in four. One in, as the as the what? As the good, as good, it looks like two and three as the bad seems to be a consensus. Okay, yeah, well, ish. Didn't need me didn't. or Miss Claire at all. You already knew how to buy your steaks. Yep. So Miss Christina goes to the next slide. Yep. See, you will see exactly the order that me and Miss Claire would buy you. Mm -hmm. So four and one are definitely your better steaks, and we say better steaks because they have more marbling within them which means they have more fat, which means they have more flavor. Absolutely. Now, I want y'all to take a look at that number one steak real quick. Mm -hmm. Now, over close to the bone, do you see how there's that kind of a chunk of fat in there? That is not marbling. Mm -hmm. But even though that steak has that chunk of fat next to the bone, it still has a bigger muscle and more marbling within that muscle than the other steaks. And so we still really like that steak a lot. But four is very consistent. We probably take that one first and then take that one. Then we're going to move into two and three. It has nothing to do with their color. Mm -hmm. Simply, if you look at it, you can see there's less white flecks in that state. Now, if you let these cut on the counter and they all came up the same red, it might be a little different story. But this is what we saw in the grocery store. So yeah. this is what we did. Yeah. Here's the other thing. Y'all remember prime choice and select? Yes. What if I told y'all that all four of these states were labeled as select steaks. So there are budget steaks. There are budget steaks. But they don't look the same. They don't look the same. Human error happens. Yeah. And when we're grading, sometimes that occurs. And well, are these the most marbled steaks out there? Probably no. Not. I would definitely say that four and one are on that upper edge of selected, maybe in that lower lead edge of choice. Cool. So if you actually know what you're looking for, and you go digging through that select section, or you go digging through that choice section, you might just find something a little higher. And the opposite can happen too. When you buy and spend that good money on a prime steak, you deserve to know if it's actually prime. Yeah. So make sure you check out that that marbling. Very cool. Miss Clara, Miss Crystal, Amy yeah. wants to know how do you like your steak cooked? She likes hers medium rare. Well. I will say, I'm pretty opinionated about this one, and I really think it's a sin to cook a steak any other than medium rare. I would agree. I'm a medium rare person. There are definitely times when you might not want to cook it medium rare. Yeah. Maybe you're in one of those immunosuppressant kind of um, situations. Maybe you're older. Maybe you're really young. Maybe you're just sick a lot. Mm -hmm. And you want to have a full, well-done steak at that point. Mm -hmm. But I do like a medium rare. And since it was brought up, yeah. let's Give our control center manager, manager a second. She has a slide that will show us what temperatures. Yes. And while she's pouring that up, do y'all remember what temperature you cook pork to? Whole muscle pork, whole muscle pork, to, to be considered safe. And what do we, or what do we cook all chicken to? to all be safe? chicken. There were two different numbers. Yep. And mm -hmm. as Christina's pulling that up, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're going to see that beef has different. So, it's pulled up. Okay. So we're going to give you some time to work on those chats. Mm -hmm. And as you're doing that, we're going to start moving forward. And if you have any questions about those temperatures for beef, just let us know. But this is a great time as y'all are looking at that. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll answer that question about slaughter. And so because y'all are asking such great questions, so good, we're going to have to go a little long at camp today. 
but we would hate to not answer all your questions. Yeah. So let's talk about that slaughter process. So slaughter is a very highly regulated process, right? Because it all goes down to animal welfare and food safety and worker safety. And all of those things have to be considered at all times during the what we call harvest process. Um, harvest is just a little prettier of a word than saying slaughter all the time. And so the question really was what's the best way to do it? Well, the best way to do it is let a professional do it. Truth to all. We have harvest facilities and processing facilities all over most states that if you're wanting to have one of your own animals harvested, you can take them and they can do all of that. They're trained, they're um, sometimes they're if they need to be inspected so they can sell meat or anything like that. They have procedures in line to keep workers safe, to keep your food safe, and keep your animal as low stress as possible. Because when we stress an animal out, it causes the meat to be very bad. So it tastes good. Um, it'll get tough. It'll have problems with it. You're not. They may bruise themselves, and if they bruise themselves, you have to. You lose that chunk of meat. And so, the best way to harvest animals is to take it to a processing facility. Um, and then from there, it, it's very much a process of that they will. They'll render the animal unconscious. And then they'll drain the animal of their blood once that occurs. Okay. Um, and then once that occurs, then they can take the hide off, and then they can wash it at 180 degrees. Ooh, and I get all of those bacteria away. All of that bacteria. Get it off. And they do that wash many, many times. Mm -hmm. And so they'll wash it, and then once it's washed, you're gonna put it in the cooler to drop that temperature as low as possible. Again, for getting bacteria. Don't want bacteria. They'll also sometimes spray, spray things like lactic acid, which is vinegar mm. um, to prevent any other bacteria from growing and then once it's all cooled down that's when they'll start breaking it down into rounds and chucks and things like those and lines. brisket and brisket that's a wonderful question Good but question. it's very very hard to slaughter an animal at home without any practice yeah. so best case scenario for the animal for you and for your end product is to go to a professional take it to the pros wonderful question yeah so miss christina Yes. What are they telling us in the chat? Okay, hold on. Did everybody get to see those temperatures? All right. Looks like 220 is very popular oh, answer. Okay. So, oh, well, that leads us right into our next part. You are going to lead Miss Claire right into yes. cooking. We cook it. And when we cook, first thing we got to do is build the fire. We gotta build a fire, and we're gonna, we're gonna try to get that fire mm -hmm. to 220 degrees for barbecue, ma'am. And we get it to that 220 degrees so that we can cook our pork to 145, yes, and our chicken to 165, yes. Those are doneness degrees for those two, yes. Awesome. For beef, it varies, it does. But that medium rare, mm -hmm. you're gonna be looking at about 140. Pretty good. But we are going to go a little further than that. Yeah. We are going to eat our brisket at a medium rare because we want it falling apart. We do. So we're going to go way over that. Oh, yeah. Way over. But because it's low and slow, it's okay. Yeah. It's low and slow, which means it is a tender. Tender, tender barbecue. So, Miss Christina, you can pull down the temperatures and go to the building of Fireslide. We have some videos for y'all this time, so let's go ahead and watch our first video. We're gonna help taking a time out real quick. Sorry, Is finish. there another? So that first one that you saw was us lighting our chimney. Lighting oh, our is this the one you played? Charcoal chimney. And then we're gonna dump our charcoal onto our fresh bed of charcoal in our smoker. So what y'all saw first okay. is us dumping our hot oh, charcoal. You saw it opposite. No so deal. we're gonna do it again do from it again. the beginning. Just plus plus. Let's slide. do it again. Oh, this is a video. It should be. Okay. Oh, our video is loading. Oh, our video is being implemented. Welcome to virtual camp, guys. Here it is. Yesterday you couldn't see me. Today you can see. Today me. you can't see the video. You know what? <laughs> video. That's okay. About it, but we've talked about it so much. Yeah, guys. Let's check out that charcoal one more time. Yeah. One more time. Because now we have our lit charcoal, and it seems our fresh 
fresh bed in our smoker. Out of that metal chimney. Yes. And again, we may have some technical difficulties at times, mm -hmm. but virtual camp means you can relive camp every single day. It's true. We have time stamps, the times of every camp we've done so far. So you can just run back over to chicken yes. or pork day. Yeah. But we really grill on chicken day. Yeah. So run over to pork day and you can see the time stamps yes. on what a chimney is and what that means. Yes. And the big thing with the fire is you need that fire triangle, right? You need that oxygen, you need your heat, and you need your fuel. And that's yes. going to get you cooking at 220 degrees. So, uh, let's talk about it. Let's talk. We brisket. told you we smoked the brisket, right? So we smoked it at 220 degrees. Let's go to that next slide, Miss Christina, and we have our smoked brisket recipe. Now, remember, you're going to get these in our follow up email, but Pretty much, it's a pretty simple recipe. It is a pretty simple recipe. It is. And, sure. So, I'm going to let her go over it, mm -hmm. and then we're going to answer some questions. Yeah. So, our smoked brisket recipe, pretty simple. We did a dry rub. We um, had, so we just rubbed the brisket. We have a video that you're going to watch in a second. And then we put our brisket into the smoker that we had tempted at about 220, 225. And then you let it sit, it's about one and a half hours, one to one and a half hours per one pound of brisket. And we did ours for about 12 hours. And so let's go ahead and watch those videos on our next slide. Let's see if we can get those to play, maybe. Maybe we will. There should be three. Our first one is me doing the dry rub. Let's go ahead and watch that one. In the meantime, ladies. Yeah. Lynette asks, which type of charcoal do y'all recommend? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. So we've learned a lot. We have. <laughs> this week, we have also become barbecue masters. We have. So since we are talking barbecue today, we really have found that we like two different types. Yes. Um, true barbecue purists yes. probably wouldn't agree with us on all of it. But that's okay. But we like what is also easy and convenient. Mm -hmm. And so once, uh, Ms. Christina, you can just work through those videos so it's just it's rub and then putting it in the ingredients and then spraying it with that apple cider vinegar to keep it moist yes so removing it into the smoker and then keeping it uh, moist and so for the charcoal we like mm -hmm. to have chunk charcoal mm -hmm. in our smoker uh -huh. as fresh so we don't pre-burn that yes but then we actually really enjoyed having our our instant light charcoal today yeah. or during cooking because it got very hot mm -hmm. and we didn't have to use very much of it. We would only really just need a coal to three or so. Yeah, not many. To sit on top of that fresh chunk charcoal. Mm -hmm. And since we have such a small smoker, we didn't have to have much of it. And mm -hmm. so we like the chunk for the lasting of it, but we really like the instant light just to get the fire going, go and, and get, get it up rolling 20 and do exactly what we or did. If we saw our temperature start to drop just a little bit, that instant light brings the heat right away. It's really good. Easy to keep around. your side fire because you're definitely going to have to have a side fire available. Yeah. It's 16 hours. So you're going to have to build your fire. And then, you know, after wow. five, six, seven hours, you're going to have to repeat your fire. Mm -hmm. So, we really enjoyed both of those times. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're also going to have your wood as well for the flavor. Yeah. I'm going to go get our brisket. Our second video is taking some time to load. That's so, okay. why don't you tell them about it? So, all that second picture is is something very simple it's us taking the brisket and putting it onto the smoker. And the only thing that I want you to remember is that when you look at a brisket, it has two parts it has a really thick part and a really thin part. The thick part is known as the point, and the thin part is known as the flat. And we actually took ours, and we put it on the grill so that the point was as close to the heat as possible, and the flat was the farther away part, because the flat, since it's so thin, is going to cook faster. Mm -hmm. And often, true barbecue people will actually separate those two things, those two parts, after cooking. We did it before cooking, because we were going to do two methods, and we only wanted to buy one brisket, so we cooked our point on the barbecue and we cook our flat in our non-conditional method. Yeah. And so Miss Claire has our beautiful we have it. brisket. To Let show. me walk it to you. So Miss Christina, can we see this? Yes, you can we can see awesome. it. Awesome. So we have uh, you see that ring that we have around our brisket? That remember that means that we smoked it. You see we have a nice crust around it. 
It's really, really good, and it smells so good. I wish you could smell Speaking it. Speaking of crust, we yes. had a question about um, dry rubs versus wet rubs, and which do y'all prefer, which is better? That question comes from Aaron. Thanks. Aaron, shout yeah, out. Good question. Okay, so we did a dry rub for our smoked brisket. And so the dry rub is going to help us to create that crust because it gets crispy with all of those um, spices and things. But uh, we actually did a wet rub with our next recipe. And I kind of think that, I don't know if Miss Crystal has, I think it's more of an opinion. I liked our wet rub for our next method. And then I like our dry rub for smoking because it's nice to get a crust. I agree. I think if you're one of those people who lives for burnt ends or yes. really crispy pieces of the meat and you like beefy flavor, mm -hmm. you're really going to prefer that dry rub. Probably so. If you're somebody who likes to get the flavor of the rub and you like to have that Worcestershire or soy taste, whatever it, is that, whatever it is that's making it wet, if uh -huh. you enjoy those ingredient flavors, on top of the beef flavor, mm -hmm. then you're going to be a wet rub kind of person. Yeah. There's no right or wrong to it. It's a completely preference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Question. So I mentioned before, we talked about we always have our traditional method of barbecue, which is our smoked brisket today. But we also did a non-traditional method of barbecue. And guys, Miss Claire came through on finding this recipe. It's real good. We love up. this recipe. And thank goodness. We did, because while we love our smoked brisket, mm -hmm. it's going to rain on the 4th of July. It is. We're so sad. There's a huge yeah. chance. We're sad. But that does not mean we can't have that yummy barbecue flavor. Now, guys, you said low and slow and smoke yes. required to be barbecued. Yes. So our non-traditional method of barbecue, no. no. But can you mimic those flavors? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, and the way that we mimic the flavor with our oven smoked brisket is that we use something called liquid smoke and it is exactly what it sounds like it is a liquid that tastes very smoky so if you look at the recipe we have uh, we did a wet rub which is our we had our Worcestershire sauce we had our barbecue sauce our liquid smoke a bunch of spices we put it all show them this crystal we put it all into a pyrex dish then we took our brisket and we put, we use, there's always a side that has a little more fat on it. We put that side down, bit, kind of moved it around. We got that good flavor on top. We flipped our brisket over, and then we put it into our oven. Now, your oven is still in a low temperature. It's at 275 degrees. And that, the thing is, though, it's only going to take about five to six hours or so to cook. And so that goes a lot quicker than our smoked brisket, and it's pretty easy. You can pretty much put it in your oven, forget about it, and then when it beats that it's done, you just turn your oven off, let it set for an hour, you take it out, you have delicious oven smoked brisket. Guys, I'm a traditionalist, and I love smoked brisket, but I am obsessed with this non-traditional format. It's really, really And good. it makes brisket so accessible. It does. Maybe you want some barbecue in the wintertime. Maybe you don't have a smoker yeah. or a grill or you live in an apartment or whatever. Yeah. Or it's a Wednesday and you don't have time to be smoking a brisket. It does not mean you can't have barbecue. It does, it does not mean you can't have beef. It's true. You should do this. You should you absolutely, absolutely do this. It's so good. We are so proud of that. So that wraps up. That's it. The Louisiana Beef Industry Council sponsored Beef Day. Thank you, LBIC. At Virtual Barbecue Booth. Thank you, our viewers. So amazing to have y'all on this journey with us. Yes. But you know what? It's not quite over. No, it's not. It's not. We love connecting with y'all. We do. So much. It's so fun. And remember, we have a special message waiting for y'all mm -hmm. on Flipgrid from our state 4-H president. She wants to say hi to you and tell you how proud she is that you came to camp with us. Yes. And we're going to do Vespers along with you right now. Absolutely. And I know it's scary to get on Flipgrid and do your video. But you know what? Join Abby yeah. and Molly yes. and Elise. Yes. We've met all these great people from across Louisiana and outside Louisiana mm -hmm. to say hi to us here in virtual. 
through that. And maybe if you don't want to do a video, you just go and write their post yeah. to say, hey, I'm here. I want to be a part of it. I see it. Yes. There's an app called Flipgrid, and you use Barbecue Boot Camp 3 as your flip code, or you go to the website on the screen, mm -hmm. and you leave us our best verse. And all we want is to hear how much you love camp. Yes. Say hi to us. Tell us your name. Tell us where you're from. Tell us if you enjoyed camp today and what your favorite part of beef day was. Yeah. I want to know what type of beef do you like to eat. And I also want to know, are you going to try smoking? Are you? Are you going to try it non-traditionally or traditionally? Whatever you want to tell us, tell us. Yeah. And as tradition, we want you to do it. So we're going to do it with you. We are. So we're going to pull out our phone and we're going to do our best for us right now. You have plenty of time to join us. So download the Flipgrid app or go to the website and use flip code barbecue bootcamp three. So Ms. Claire, I got my Flipgrid up. I'm getting it. We're getting there. Oh, we're here. We're here. Look, I already see Anna and Miss Hannah. Oh, your counselor, Miss Hannah, did her vespers already. Love and they're it. dying to meet you. So we're gonna go do ours. Mm -hmm. We're gonna like Miss Hannah and Miss Anna's. And then we're gonna meet y'all later. Yes. So here we go. All right. Hey, Barbie, you look Hey, Barbie, you look so much fun today. Today is my favorite. And this makes so much for the LBS. So ready to eat this brisket. So how are we going to go? I can't wait to say hi. Bye. We are so glad that y'all are with us. Bye. Selfie time. Hey, y'all. What's going on tonight? Oh. So, oh, girl. Miss Christina, we do we have plans, plans tonight? Is that what oh, I'm? We have plans. Do we have tonight. plans tonight? We have big plans. We tonight. have the best plans tonight. We are having 4-H family game night. Woo! Yay! Live, live on YouTube. On YouTube. You remember all those kahoot challenges that y'all have been doing all week? We have the pork one. We have the chicken one. The beef one is available, so you can still get some study time in before yeah, tonight. Yeah, yeah, get ready to dominate. And then tonight, it's going to add all of those together, and we're going to have a live family game night Woo! with winners. Yes, who get prizes? The top three winners of our Kahoot family game night yes. will win prizes. Yes. It's going to be so much fun. Mm -hmm. So make sure you log into YouTube at 7 p.m. tonight. Seven. You can use the link on our slideshow there. It will also be in the description of the video. Yes. It has been in some of your emails yes. that we've been sending out. Yes. But if you just go to the Louisiana 4-H page on YouTube, yep, it is there. And if you go right now, you can set a reminder so you won't Ooh. even forget. So it'll say, hey, come get your prizes. Yes. And all you need to participate is a device that you can either download the Kahoot app on mm -hmm. or go to Kahoot.it. So you just need a screen. Awesome. A screen and an internet connection, and everybody can play around along. You can take all the things you learned at Virtual Barbecue Boot Camp and show your parents how smart you are. Woo! And that's going to make us absolute barbecue champions. Love it. And then what do I do if I win? If you win, uh -huh. to get your prizes, we're going to have you screenshot, screenshot your phone or your take a picture of your screen. Let us know that you won, and we're just going to email you with all of those details. Awesome. So... I need everybody to do one last thing before you log off. Do your flip grid. Do your flip grid. And then tell us you're going to join us on YouTube tonight for game, Family Game Night. So excited. And then tell everyone you know, even if they didn't come to Barbecue Boot Camp, they can play along. They can still play. It is so much fun. Absolutely. Guys. We're hoping to see you tonight. We can't wait. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. We'll see you at Family Game Night. Can't wait to see you later. Bye, guys. Bye.